Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. This is Taliesin McKnight, and today I would like to examine the solstices and equinoxes, the cycles and rhythms in nature, and we will be applying this to see if we could find some kind of a hidden doctrine, a secret doctrine, contained right under our nose in the cycles and rhythms of nature. And in order to really examine this, we will also be looking at the tarot. Maybe there's a deeper meaning in the cards of the tarot. And also at alchemy, which was a really important secret or hidden occult philosophy in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So alchemy, tarot, and we'll be we'll be trying to search through ancient temples in a sense to try to uncover some of this hidden wisdom that may have been hidden. Okay. Hermeticism was a Greek and Egyptian philosophy that goes back to ancient Egypt. It is a blending of Greek and Egyptian thought, a close cousin of Gnosticism. And uh, Greek philosophy, Pythagoreanism, Hermeticism, this ancient knowledge, which may possibly be knowledge going back to the mystery schools of Egypt, Greece, and Rome, which trickle down in uh, magic, alchemy, tarot, things like that. This knowledge trickled down through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, to today. And now many people are trying to under, uncover this uh, secret knowledge, this hidden wisdom. Okay. <clears throat> the ancients obviously worshipped the sun. That's no secret. Um, the solstices and equinoxes were the basis of uh, our calendar. To ancient primitive man, planting in the spring and uh, harvesting, the planting and harvesting was very important. Man worshipped the earth for fertility and uh, worshipped the sun, the giver of life. Um, the ancient Greeks, Romans, the Egyptians, most ancient pagan cultures had a reverence for the solstices and equinox. The solstices are the two days in the year when you have the least amount of sunlight, the winter solstice, which is where we get Christmas, which Christianity has the birth of Jesus around the winter solstice. That's interesting. The uh, least sunlight, when the sunlight begins growing, the birth of the sun, the summer solstice is the longest day of the year, and then the days grow shorter. And then equinox from equi, equal, equal day and night at spring and autumn. So the ancients looked in nature and used it as an object of contemplation, deep introspection. If you ask a modern person, what does the falling leaves of autumn mean? They would look at you kind of funny and say it doesn't mean anything. It's just the earth tilting on its axis. If you ask a modern person, most modern people, what does sunrise mean? What is the deeper meaning of sunset? They would look at you kind of strange and say it doesn't mean anything. It's just the earth rotating. But the ancients saw a deeper meaning. Okay, um, most modern religious scholars think that primitive man was stupid because he thought the sun was a god that was born each morning at sunrise and died at sunset. But ancient man lived in a more uh, symbolic, mythical worldview. The cycle of a day was a life cycle. You had the sun was born at sunrise, the beginning of a day, sunrise. The sun reached the middle of life at the hottest part of the day, noon. And then the sun seemed to die at sunset, okay, and then enter the underworld 
before being born again at sunrise. The ancient Egyptians obviously had a similar conception. The Book of Gates and uh, the Book of Amtuat are two Egyptian texts, which I've read and I've talked about before. These are two texts that we have as a primary source. These texts date back to uh, the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, okay? which uh, the sun god Ra went through his boat across the sky, and at sunset went through the underworld, the land of the dead, and came out at sunrise. So, um, the ancient Greeks and Romans honored the solstices and equinoxes. So most ancient pagan cultures had a reverence for the passage of the seasons. Okay. Neo-paganism focuses a lot, some forms of neo-paganism, on the solstices and equinoxes. Wicca, the Wiccan wheel of the year, has the solstices and equinoxes and the midway points. You have Samhain, which is Halloween, basically. It's the Day of the Dead Samhain. Yule, which is the winter solstice, the birth of the sun. Embolk, the increase of light. Ostara which is the beginning of spring and fertility. Lunasa, which is uh, the harvest. No, you had Beltane, okay, which begins the light half of the year, the Celts lit bonfires. The summer solstice, the longest day of the year. Lunasa, which is the wheat and grain harvest. And Maybon, which is the autumn equinox, okay, returning back to Samhain. <clears throat> the Norse reverenced the solstices and equinoxes, the Egyptians, the Greeks, every single ancient culture known to man had a religious reverence for the solstices and equinoxes. That's just a fact. That's how it is. Um, the solar cross is one of the oldest symbols known to man, and it's a cross within a circle. A circle implies a rotation. Okay, a rotation. And uh, the four points, of course, east, east, south, north, I mean west and north, but also the four points, the four seasons, also sunrise, noon, sunset, and uh, winter. Christianity uses this to an extent. Paganism, which Christianity has so faithfully uh, preserved, still remains intact today. The Romans chose uh, the winter solstice as the time to celebrate the birth of Christ. This is the, the shortest day of the year, and from then on the sun grows, the days grow longer. So this is a Christmas. We put lights on our trees, and evergreen is a symbol. It's the only plant that's still fertile and flourishing in the winter in the northern hemisphere, and lights on the tree obvious symbolism, okay? Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And it represents resurrection uh, right when fertility enters. Easter eggs, this is a pagan custom, okay? The, the eggs represent fertility. And uh, the pagans, they would plant in the spring, and you notice fertility, animals mating in the spring. The summer is the height of power. Autumn, the uh, leaves fall off the trees. This must have seemed like death. So, <clears throat> to the ancients, this was a life cycle. Okay, this was a life cycle. Each morning, the sun god was born. He reached, this is also spring. He reached his height of power at noon, the hottest part of the day, or summer, and uh, at sunset died. Also in the year, you have autumn. The leaves come off the trees. They appear to die. And then winter, the coldest and darkest moment. Okay, this is at the peak of the underworld, or you could say the birth. So in a day, you see a life cycle. And in the year, the world seems to go through a life cycle. This may possibly have, have had a deep significance for the ancients, 
obviously they base their calendars on this. In uh, Persia, in Iran, um, Norus is the the new year. Okay, even though it's an Islamic country, New Year is Norus, which is a spring festival. Okay, um, Christmas, Easter. Um, St. John's Day in Christianity. In Judaism, they have uh, an agricultural calendar for the religious holidays, um, harvest, things like that. So this is very ancient, very old. Does it have any deeper significance within the uh, Western esoteric philosophy? Again, um, I'm not saying that this philosophy is true or not. I'm not a preacher or anything. I'm a student that studies and talks about it, so I'm not saying it's true or not, but I'm interested in studying what this philosophy is and discussing it because I'm studying it, okay? So I, I keep mentioning this in my video, I'm not saying it's true or not, but it's interesting and for skeptics that don't really believe in any of this, it's still interesting for an academic study of uh, what this hidden philosophy, what's interesting about this tradition, even if you don't believe in it, just as an academic interest, is that it's hidden, okay? It's hidden in symbol in all this. So it's very interesting. Now, the uh, Wheel of Fortune card in the tarot, um, this was uh, a symbol used in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. Well, in the Renaissance, the Wheel of Fortune was, which is the usually number 10 in the tarot. It's a tarot card. It was a symbol in the Renaissance for the folly of pride and uh, position and power. It shows a figure going up the wheel, reaching his height of power, and then falling and then getting crushed by the wheel. Right here, he would often say, I will reign. Okay, this is youth. Up here is the king reigning in power. I reign. And then the king says, I did reign. This is old age. And then he's getting crushed by the will. I have no reign. So this is someone rising to power at the top and then declining and then dying. So it shows, it was a symbol in the Renaissance. This was a real symbol. This symbol was used in the Renaissance in Europe for the folly of pride and position and power. Like, oh, I'm this. <laughs> yeah, and then you're going to die. You know? It's like, uh, life stinks and then you die. So anyways, okay. Now, this is also sunrise, noon, sunset, and midnight, this is spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Okay, the, uh, some pe people that study Eastern philosophy would obviously see the uh, wheel of rebirth. It's the wheel of the year, and it is the wheel of rebirth of the sun, if you look at it in our calendar. Now, the wheel of fortune is uh, usually ascribed the number 10 from the major arcana which is ascribed to 4 because you have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10, okay, in Pythagoreanism, which is the Tetractus, which is a symbol. We don't have time to discuss that today. So the Wheel of Fortune. Now the sun rises in the east. Now the sun does not go straight overhead, okay? In astrology, it's called the ecliptic in astrology. And that is how, well, the earth is tilted on its axis. So the sun does not go straight overhead. It's not like that. The sun rises in the east. It goes slightly to the south, sets in the west. And at midnight, it's not directly below us. The sun is slightly to the north. Okay, so it rises in the east, goes to the south, the west, the north. This is the elemental circle. This is the circle of the elements which uh, students of magic, uh, yes, some people practice magic and Wicca and Western ceremonial magic, they would find it interesting 
that uh, the sun, the path of the sun, is east, south, west, and north. This is the elemental circle, the rotation of the elements. And uh, so, yeah, it goes through. Uh, east is uh, sunrise, air. South, fire, the hottest part of the day at noon. West is water, extinguished in the water. And then north, it goes into the earth, into the underworld of the earth at, in the north. So, um, that's interesting. Okay? And the sun makes sort of a cross because in, in uh, the summer, the hottest part is kind of directly above. And in the winter, it goes more to the south. So the sun goes from east to west, and in the year, heat and cold from south towards the north. So the sun makes a cross. So that's interesting. So anyways, <clears throat> at sunrise, you have birth. The birth of the sun, you could say mythologically. And then the sun grows. At noon, the sun reaches its height of power. This is the middle of life, maturity. At sunset, the sun dies, goes into the underworld, and rises at sunrise. So this is obviously, symbolically, mythologically, it could be seen as a life cycle. Now it's interesting that every day, as human beings, we go through what appears to be a life cycle. We wake up in the morning, which is like birth, the birth of a new day. And we do uh, whatever the hell we do. We're creatures of habit, routine, brush our teeth, shower, whatever. Then we go to work and all that. Usually at night time, we go into our homes, we relax. And in the middle of the night, we lay down in bed, close our eyes, and go to sleep. This looks a lot like death, okay? You lay down in a bed, close your eyes. This is uh, death. And then at sunrise, you wake up. This is birth. So if you look at the daily cycle of human beings, you see what appears to be a life cycle. Waking up in the morning is birth. Going to bed at night is death. This is a, a miniature life, in a sense. Okay? So we have a, a daily cycle of the sun. A daily cycle is human beings. Now, we have cycles within cycles. In the year, you have the same thing. To the ancients in the autumn, the leaves started falling off the trees. The trees seemed to be dying. Old age and death. This is decay and death. Autumn in the northern hemisphere. And then in the winter, the plants seemed to be dead. Unless they're, uh, I don't know, an evergreen. The world seems to be dead. And in the uh, winter solstice, the days start to get longer. So that's a good thing. So the world is dead. The evil principle of cold and death. As opposed to the light of life and heat. Now in the uh, spring equinox, this is sunrise. Fertility returns to the earth. The plants bloom with life. You plant the seed, which obviously has a sexual connotation, planting the seed in the animal's mate. Okay, in the summer, the hide of life, the trees flourish, there's birds singing. In the autumn, goes back into death, and in the winter. Now, in Celtic mythology, blackbirds, crows, were a symbol of the underworld and death. You know, even in our popular mind, I live in America, United States, we tend to see crows as a symbol of death, you know, uh, a crow. Now, and then there's that movie, The Crow. But anyways, <clears throat> so in Celtic mythology, the Morrigan was the goddess of death, okay? So anyways, or a threefold goddess in Celtic mythology, you had Bav, Katha, Neman, and Maka. But anyways, the crow is a symbol of death. You notice in the cold half of the year, at least where I live, all you see is blackbirds, okay? So that's death. So anyways, in the year, you have planting and harvest, which was obviously important to the ancients who lived off the land. <clears throat> planting and harvest. So in the year, you have what looks like a life cycle, the life of the sun, 
the life of the light of the world, the heat which gives life to the world. Nature itself seemed to die and be reborn each year. So in the day, you have a life cycle. In the year, you have a life cycle. For people that live close to the earth, planting and harvesting, a year for a human being must have looked like a life in miniature form. Um, even in cultures that are not agricultural, we still tend to live by this cycle. Businesses, it depends on what you do for a living, businesses sometimes seem to, to slow down in the fall, and in the winter, businesses is dead, especially if you do construction or something. In the spring, business picks up, and in the winter, it's, I mean, in, in the summer, it's at its height, it's business is booming, and then business tends to slow down in the autumn, and in the winter, it's dead, comes back in the spring. So even though we're not close to the land anymore, even modern technological cultures today, we can't break ourselves truly from this cycle. It is ingrained in us in, as human beings. Birth, growth, decay, and death. Now in the life of a human being, we have a childhood, youth. This is usually where we're wild and stupid. Okay? And then we have maturity, bills, responsibility. Well, to hell with that. And then you have old age. So, in the life of man, you seem to have four cycles, which goes along with the cycle in a day and a year. Four seasons. Four seasons in the life of man. In uh, Greek mythology, you had four ages. The Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. So that is interesting. Now, there are two forces at play. Light and darkness in the day. Or in the year, you could say the light half of the year and the dark half of the year. In a human life, you could say that childhood sucks because we're dependent on our parents. And then old age sucks because we're kind of helpless. But the middle of life is where we're flourishing. We're in control of everything. So in a day, for a human being... You could say at night we're relaxing, we're chilling, in the day we're active, getting stuff done. Unless you're a night owl like me. So you see two forces at play, two halves, light and darkness in the year, the cold half of the year, infertile, and the hot, fertile half of the year. <clears throat> so you have two halves, hot and cold, life and death. So this makes a sort of horizontal arm. Okay, now there's something else happening which makes the vertical axis of this cross, and that is growth and decay, okay? From midnight to noon, the sun is growing, comes over the horizon, reaches its peak at noon. This is growth. And then the sun declines, makes us halfway at sunset and goes keeps going down to midnight. So in between the day and night, you have a gr another cycle of growth and decay. Um, within the human life, you have uh, childhood to maturity, growth, and then we start decaying, maturity to old age. We start going over the hill and declining, which sucks, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> I'm making this kind of way too long and drawn out. I'm not meaning to, but I'm trying to really cover this. In the year, you have the increase of light from the winter solstice to the summer solstice, and then the nights become longer from the summer solstice to the winter solstice. So even though you have a dark and light half of the year, the horizontal axis, day and night, you also have this growth and decay, which is a vertical axis, and together, these make a cross. <clears throat> now, um, in uh, Christianity, this is, I'm, I'm about to talk about how a Christian symbol, back when the church reigned, could be used to hide a bunch of occult, forbidden stuff that the church didn't want. People used to have to act like good church-going Christians back in the day. Or they would get burned to death at the stake. 
The cross uh, shows uh, four letters, I N R I, which stands in Latin, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Udirum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, in alchemy, which really hid this deep occult philosophy in the Renaissance behind the veil of uh, chemistry, they were really hiding all kinds of stuff that were heretical, that the church did not like. Okay? They saw this as the four elements. The cross is four elements, okay? Uh, these are the first four letters for the Hebrew names of the four elements. Yom, sea, nur, fire, ruach, air or wind or breath, and yabasha, dry land or earth. So yom, nur, ruach, yabasha, the four names of the four elements. Now, the Hebrew letter Yud in the Kabbalah, um, I already talked about the tarot and how the Wheel of Fortune shows this cycle of life. In the Kabbalah, Yud is ascribed to Virgo, Virgo being growth and fertility. The letter Nun, Hebrew N, the letter Nun is ascribed to Scorpio, which is the kiss of death. This is uh, when the sun dies in the year. Um, Halloween happens in the middle of Scorpio. This is uh, Apophis, or set. This is death. So I and N, Yud Nun, and the Kabbalah could be seen as uh, Virgo, growth and fertility, and Scorpio, the principle of death. So again, you have uh, growth and decay. And the letter Resh is the sun in the Kabbalah. So you have Virgo, Scorpio, and the sun, and it returns to the Yud, back to fertility. So in the symbol of the cross, alchemists saw this as a symbol of the four elements, and growth, decay, and the sun. And uh, in the hexagram ritual of the golden dawn, I really can't go that deeply into this because I have been initiated into the Golden Dawn, and we're not allowed to talk about it, okay? When you, when you join the Golden Dawn, you, you take an oath. So I have to respect that as a man of honor, but I can say that uh, Yao, I-A-O, Isis, Apophis, Osiris, Yao, Isis, Mighty Mother, Set, Apophis, Destroyer, Soul, Osiris, Slain, and Risen, this is the sun in growth and decay, and this is how this uh, elemental cross... Now, again, this is a life cycle. Sunrise, noon, sunset, and midnight. This is a life cycle. The seasons in the year, a life cycle. <clears throat> now, in magic, in Wicca, and ceremonial magic, you have the circle of the elements. The sun rises in the east, that's air, the sun, as I said, it's on the ecliptic. It's in the south at noon, fire. The sun sets in the west, water. And at midnight, it goes into the earth, under the earth and the underworld, earth. So you have east, air, south, fire, west, water, and north, earth. I think that there's probably a connection here between the elemental circle and the rotation of the elements, and the sun, and the wheel of fortune, and uh, the Kabbalah, all of this, I believe, may possibly be tied together. The elemental circle. If you, in magic, in Wicca, in ceremonial magic, and closely derived systems, when you go clockwise in the, in the magic circle, or Josel, sunwise or clockwise, it's to bring in, <clears throat> but to go anti-clockwise or Wittershins, anti-sunwise, to move against the sun is to get rid of. So it's interesting. Now, the circle of the elements in alchemy is what you call the rotation of the elements. Now, earth, air, fire, and water uh, do not really represent elements on the periodic table. People today are like, the Earth isn't composed of Earth, air, fire, and water. It's made of helium and oxygen and, and uh, carbon and things like that. These are not intended to be taken as uh, chemical elements. They are states of matter. You have solid Earth, 
the stable solids, earth. You have liquid, which is water. In magic, wine could be considered the element of water in magic. So could beer, wine, things like that. So water in magic, in, in uh, Greek philosophy, this does not mean H2O. Any liquid is water from a magic standpoint. Air is gas, and fire is plasma, but it's also the element that transmutes from lower states into higher states. So in alchemy, <clears throat> you have earth, air, fire, and water, which are solids, liquids, and gas, and plasma, okay? And uh, in magic, you look at how uh, energy reacts to solids and liquids, which are good at holding and storing energy. So you may charge a talisman, or you may charge blessed water and sprinkle it. In magic, it's how the different states of matter react to vibrations and energy from your chi, your aura. Some people believe in this stuff. So that's how these states of matter, which is uh, how physics works, <clears throat> deals with, theoretically, with astral vibrations. Air communicates energy, okay, and fire burns something up and releases. So anyways, um, in uh, alchemy they had what they called the rotation of the elements. A solid could be turned into a liquid through melting all things have a melting point. Even rocks have a melting point, okay? And so it's not just plastic. Melting turns a earth into water. Also, solution or dissolution into uh, a liquid is turning earth into water. Now, this is a way of refining a substance. All the impurities go to the bottom. Water, when heated, evaporates into gas. And this, is, again, is a way of refining a product. Gas could be ignited in fire, or you could take fire or heat or the sun as that which uh, <clears throat> transmutes. Now, gas could be brought back into water. Air could be brought back into water through condensation and uh, liquid into earth. So, in alchemy, this is called the rotation of the elements. And this is a process of refining a substance to remove. It is a form of purification and refining a matter in alchemy. So you have, now, what is the whole purpose behind all this? So the sun, you have a life cycle in the sun, daily, yearly. You have a life cycle in man, which some people would take this to be the wheel of reincarnation or rebirth that we are born, we live, we die, and then we're reborn, it's that we live many lives. Some people think that. Again, I'm not a preacher. I'm like a student or scholar or something. I'm, I'm studying it and talking about it. I don't even believe in a lot of this. But, okay, theoretically, some people think that this may be reincarnation. Um, <clears throat> so, what is the whole point in an endless cycle, a vicious cycle that never ends. Is there a goal? Is there any deeper meaning? So some people think that instead of thinking of it as a circle, it is a spiral. Now, what's the difference between a spiral and a circle? A spiral returns to the same place, but it goes deeper each time. So even though it returns at the same place, it goes deeper and deeper until it reaches the center. So it is cyclical with a destination. Okay, the planets go around the sun and are getting pulled in by gravity. Um, however you want to look at it, in alchemy, refining a substance, distillation, evaporation, condensation, if you uh, turn a solid into a liquid, some of the impurities go off. If you heat the water, it goes into air gas. Some of the impurities are left as a residue. Okay, so distillation is a process in alchemy. It is evaporation and condensation back into a liquid. That is distillation. 
So to put it in alchemical terms, this uh, process may be a form of alchemical spiral of transformation. It's a period of purification and uh, refinement of the matter of the work, which is the self, to create the philosophical stone, the philosopher's stone, or the elixir of life. And uh, looking at the cycle of life, if you believe in reincarnation, you could say you learn lessons. So you're spiraling inwards. Now, one of the oldest symbols known to man is the Ouroboros, which is a symbol of a serpent making a circle with its tail in its mouth. Now, this is one of the oldest symbols I've ever seen. I've seen it in the Book of Gates, which is a text going back to ancient Egypt. Yes, a lot of these texts are translated into English. You can find them on the internet, okay, translated by Egypt Egyptologists. The Book of Gates has the Ouroboros, so I know for a fact, because I've seen it, this goes back at least to the 18th dynasty of Egypt, and it talked. It had this symbol when the sun god Ra came back from the underworld at sunrise. The Ouroboros is a symbol with a serpent with its tail in its mouth. Many people are familiar with seeing this symbol in the image of the Theosophical Society, things like that. A serpent with a snake with its tail in its mouth, making a circle. This is a symbol of recurrent cycles, such as sunrise, sunset, the phases and the seasons, recurrent cycles, okay? Notice that there's some sexual symbolism there because its tail is in its mouth like a penis in a vagina. Just saying, y'all. So it impregnates itself, and in turning, the serpent both pursues and runs away from itself. Now, if the serpent, which represents recurrent cycles, gradually consumes itself until it returns to the embodied monad, okay? In chemical refinement, you say that you gradually remove in, uh, the, uh, the impurities until you get to the quintessence, the, the center. In a spiral, you move towards the center. <clears throat> so, each day in your life, each day in a year, you may move towards your goals, okay? In a life, hopefully you grow somewhat as, as you go through the phases of life, okay? So if there is a purpose, it would be symbolized by a circle. Now, again, I talked about alchemy, Rosicrucianism, alchemy or chemistry, uh, that philosophy. I took it to the tarot, okay? I will reign, I reign, this is the height of power. I have reigned, death, and then getting crushed by the will, the will of life and death, the will of fortune, the will of the goddess Fortuna, which was a symbol in the Renaissance. Um, I took it to the Kabbalah. If there is a deeper meaning to the ancient Egyptian temples, stuff like that, which was secret, the mystery schools, I guarantee you, probably they symbolize this in the seasons, the solstices and equinoxes. So that is alchemy, Kabbalah, tarot, and uh, maybe neo-pagans out there, if you're Wiccan, if you're a neo-pagan, maybe that's some food for thought. What does sunset and sunrise mean? These are recurrent cycles, a life cycle. And that's just one way to look at it. Now, one more thing. I wanted to talk about, and this is really important if you're still with me on this video. Releasing a gas from a solid sublimation could be seen as our thoughts, our intentions going out, which condenses and comes back into matter. That this is the secret process of manifesting. Now we talked about magic and the elemental circle being the rotation through the elements in the sun. Okay. Now the Emerald Tablet is a text that talks about the affinities between the microcosm and the macrocosm. We react to our environment, our our environment reacts to us. So as above, so below. As within, so without. And this is also a key to chemistry. Remember I talked about 
In distillation, evaporation, a subtle element being removed from the gross matter. This is our thoughts and tensions going up and condensation coming down. Nature has a distillery. The sun heats the water and it evaporates, creates clouds and rains down. So the uh, subtle stuff we send out such as thoughts or energy may go up and condense and fall back down into matter. Just an idea. The Emerald Tablet, which is a key alchemical text, says, "'Tis true without lying and certain. All that is above is a reflection of that which is below, and all that is below is a reflection of that which is above, which means that man is a reflection of nature, such as cycles, and uh, nature is a reflection of man. If you want to understand man, you look within nature, which is an object of introspection to examine ourselves. Or nature is a reflection, a self-enfoldment, self-revelation of a first cause. As above, so below, microcosm and macrocosm. And as all things have been and arose from one by the mediation of one, so all things have their birth from this one thing by adaptation. This is uh, the Emerald Tablet, which was a key alchemical text in, in the Middle Ages. Okay. It says, the sun is its father, the mother is the moon. Now this could be interpreted, the action of heat upon moisture. The wind has carried it in its belly, the earth is its nurse. Which also is a reference to four elements. Its force or power is entire if it be converted into earth, a solid. Separate thou the fine from the gross. Separate the subtle from the dense with a gentle heat, with much industry. This is obviously heating a liquid and evaporating and coming back down. This is distillation, evaporation and condensing. The release of subtle energy and it condensing back into matter. It ascends from the earth to heaven and again it descends to the earth and receives the things superior and inferior. By this means you shall have the glory of the whole world. This is alchemy, obviously chemistry. Okay, separate the subtle from the dense. Obviously distillation, heating a liquid until it evaporates. It ascends up in the flask of chemistry and back down. This is uh, <clears throat> obviously a reference to distillation which again could be seen as our intentions, our thoughts, a key to magic coming back down and manifesting or you could see it as death, our soul is liberated from our body, comes back down and reincarnates and I'm not saying this is true, I'm just trying to understand this is uh, alchemy and this is this uh, hidden philosophy it draws from uh, hermeticism alchemy, Rosicrucianism, and uh, this is a type of philosophy or hidden knowledge, hidden in symbols, everywhere present, that trickle down through the Middle Ages from late antiquity. And it, we might be uncovering a hidden philosophy dating back to the uh, mystery schools. So that's interesting, the uh, fire philosophers themselves. So anyways, that is just a look at a possible glimpse at the hidden primordial tradition that is the basis of our Western mystery tradition. It's found in tarot, Kabbalah, chemistry, all that stuff. Anyways, thank you for joining me, and once again, this is Talisa McKnight. Have a great day, y'all.